How do you practice magic when you're tired or sick or burnt out or just annoyed with life? Enter Lazy Witchcraft for Crazy Shitty Days. Inside, learn how to practice simple but effective spells even when you're exhausted or have no more spoons to give. Available wherever you buy books. Moonbeaming listeners, save 40% off this fall at quarto.com backslash campaign backslash witchcraft. Welcome to the Moonbeaming Podcast. I'm Sarah Faith Gottesdiener, an artist, author, and intuitive. And together, we'll explore life through a creative and spiritual lens. You'll learn so much about mysticism, creativity, consciousness, depth psychology, business, and more. And you'll get to listen to conversations with luminaries that you won't hear anywhere else. With each episode, you'll receive insights, frameworks, inspiration, and tools to help you thrive and grow. Hello and welcome back to Moonbeaming. Thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Sarah Faith Godestiner, and probably like you, I've been reflecting on a lot. I have been feeling the pull to change things up. I've been, I'm going to use the word existential. (laughs) Yeah, because if you're not thinking about the bigger things right now, are you a human? Are you alive? Right? And I think a lot of us are in an existential mode. And existential doesn't have to be negative. It can be a way to think about what is most important to us. And what is most important to us changes. So at this time, maybe what is most important to you won't be what's most important to you one year from now. But life has a way of giving us what it is we need to focus on and be with whether we would prefer it or not. And so that might be happening to you now, and that also might be an understatement. The other little like nudge, little reminder, little mm, reassurance that you're not alone is, you know, this thought is if you're not totally questioning a lot of your life, or your identity, or what you thought was possible for you every like two to seven years, you know, are you even awake? Are you even aware? So there's that. And I'm just sharing this because I'm feeling into this for a collective thread, you know? And I think as time goes on, it's going to be more and more important to commit to your values or your priorities, and those must include your dreams and your desires. They really must. It's sort of a non-negotiable, and it's going to be harder, I think, to like hold our energy, hold our vision. And I have a lot of thoughts on that that this is absolutely not the theme for today's episode, but I just really felt called, you know, we make our plans for programming or, you know, what I want to share, what I think is timely, and then other things pop in, you know, and luckily I have other spaces where I can share more of the moment messages that come in, but I really wanted to share that. The second thing I wanted to share, and I really do think this is important, I have heard other people talking about this before. I feel as though it is one of the main theses, thesi, I don't know, is it thesis or thesi, who knows, of Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Pleasure Activism. What I want to say to you is that it's also never been more important to gather joy, to beauty hunt, It's never been more important to allow yourself to trust and receive 
when good things are happening in life or when things are going well, when you've made progress in healing or progress with chronic illness or progress around your thesis or your master's or a relationship with a difficult person or a relationship with a person you're falling in love with. You know, like it's never been more important to enjoy your life as much as you can. In our culture, we've embedded this either or black and white, rigid, very immature thinking. And I see it in all political parties. Like this is not like a one group thing, but it's this idea that you're supposed to be miserable because the world is full of suffering. And that's just not true. There's the idea that you're supposed to be, you know, totally freaking out as a means of giving sympathy to people who are going through really, 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 really hard times. I really need to say this because it's another way of dividing us. You can keep a regulated nervous system and donate to mutual funds. You can have a joyful life and be excited about certain fun things that are happening in your world and go to a protest. We are multidimensional. We are not just one thing. And as really hard things befall us and as the proverbial shiz hits the proverbial fan, we need people who can stay present, grounded, compassionate, and regulated while also helping. You know, in a lot of my classes and workshops on energetic hygiene, I talk about like this idea of not getting corded or hooked into someone else's energy, you know, not matching energy. In a lot of our upbringings, we were taught that freaking out, getting hysterical, matching the energy of someone who's, you know, really goes to an 11 for very real reasons. I'm not saying like, don't go to an 11 if you need to go to an 11 as long as you're not harming anyone else, right? But if it's time for you to cry on the couch or if it's time for you to just, you know, express rage, yeah, that's what we need to do as as humans to keep our systems in homeostasis. Yes, and adding more fuel to the energetic fire isn't helping anyone, you know? We wanna be calm if we can. And part of that calmness or part of staying centered is enjoying our life when we can and gathering joy and being joyful and expressing joy. So I wanted to say that if you're having, you know, a lot of beauty in your life and a lot of blessings in your life, that's beautiful because as we also know is that doesn't last forever either. You know, the older I get, when I'm in like an upward spiral, when I am when things are going like beautifully, you can bet that I'm going to enjoy it. You can bet your sweet bippy that I'm going to be like, hell yes, I'm spreading this joy because I've had so many times where I was undergoing unspeakable loss and grief. So I want to say that if you see someone having a beautiful, wonderful life or again, in an upward spiral or you know, in an upswing in some way, shape, or form, be happy for them. Be happy for them. Don't assume that they don't read the news. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, don't assume that they're ignorant or that they're being selfish. Multiple things can be true at once. You know, we have to give each other grace and space, and we do have to give people the benefit of the doubt as much as we need to utilize our discernment. So that's my little of the moment download I felt called to share because I think someone maybe or more than someone needed to hear that today. The other thing is, is I'm very excited to give listeners of the podcast a code for free shipping many moons 
It's now shipping. November is the month that we do our shipping. And you, sweet subscriber of the pod, if you have not ordered it already, you can get free shipping with code POD. That's P-O-D at checkout. And that is good until Friday, November 8th at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We'll put all of that in the show notes as well. All right, so we had our cosmic announcements, we had our housekeeping, and now on to this week's episode. So surprise, we're going to do another mini series today. Have you noticed my mini series fetish this year? I've really been into it. I've loved getting to explore these themes and these topics over multiple episodes. This is what I love about podcasts. I love long form. I love getting to go deep and wide. It is a really, really fun, exciting thing for me. So There are a bunch of series this year. We did basically a whole series around the cards of the year, the numbers of the year, the constellation of the year, starting with the Hermit, where we did a couple of episodes on the Hermit. And then we did these episodes I loved about the eights in the minor arcana filled with an additional episode with someone who either went through a period that resonated with the card or someone who sort of embodies that card that I wanted to talk to about some of the nuances and processes of the card. So you can go back and listen to those. I think that was in the spring. And then I did a summer series all around psychology and spirituality. I love that one. And then I just also did a mini series around magical thinking versus magical thinking. Yeah, loved it. So now I'm back. She's back. Guess who's back in the house? It's me, your enthusiastic host, SFG, in the house. And This is a mini-series about spirituality, and my thoughts on spirituality today as someone who has, you know, been a practitioner for quite a while, someone who built a business using tenets of spirituality and sharing ideas about spirituality, and in all honesty, which I think you'll learn couple episodes into this series. In all honesty, gentle listener, this is actually all reluctant. You know, like this wasn't something I consciously chose or dreamed of when I was little. This is very reluctant. And I think that's okay. And I think it's okay to be honest about it. And I think it's okay to share more about it. And I'm going to be sharing more about it in episodes to come. And all of this came through to me, this idea about exploring spirituality, because Many Moons is coming out into the world. And Many Moons is, in case you don't know, it is this project I've done for quite a while, for about a decade. And it is a spiritual guide to the year. It includes a wide, wide range of spiritual modalities, including exclusive channeling for each month. Many Moons is both a functional planner you can use. It's also a magical object where infused into it are rituals and spells that have been created for each new and full moon of the year, along with prompts and tarot bowls and illustrations and tons of space to write and reflect and keep track. And it's just a very special, very unusual project. I created it. Nothing like it existed. Now many things like it exist. But when I was creating it, it truly was like I couldn't even explain it. People didn't understand what it was. It was really born out of my intuition, out of my practice, and out of my guides, or again, the universe, or my intuition, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, 
you know, telling me to do this thing. And so because it is this very spiritual offering that changes lives and supports people in their own process, I was thinking about why I create it and why it is different than other tools. And that got me thinking about what it is I know about what it is like people need or want support from in their own spiritual practice. I've been reflecting on the past quite a bit, as I said at the top, as I'm thinking about making some larger shifts in my life. And I always think it's super useful whenever we are preparing and thinking about making larger shifts to look back to see how far you've come. You know, I've made so many quantum leaps in my life. It is absolutely amazing. I'm a different person than I was five years ago, like very different than I was a decade ago. The changes in my nervous system, in my romantic relationship, in my personhood, in my finances, and my beliefs, you know, it would take hours for me to go through all of it. For me, it is proof that spirituality is real, that magic is real, that humans are miracles, that you can change your life. Because for a long, long while, it seemed certain that I would be on a trajectory that did not look good, you know, (laughs) verging on tragic, really. And now my trajectory doesn't look like that at all. And yeah, I had self-destruction, things running in my subconscious. I had failure to launch vibes going on. You know, there was a lot happening. And it's not like that anymore. It's very, very different. I've come a long way. I have a long, long ways to go, but I have come a great distance and I'm proud of myself. And a lot of this has been from learning spiritual philosophies, methods, methodologies, practices, implementing them and seeing their effectiveness. I'm a very practical person. I don't like to waste my time. I do not like to waste other people's times times, time. And I wouldn't practice if it didn't work. I wouldn't practice if I haven't seen miracles in my own life. And the biggest offering, you know, the most magical object I create so far is many moons. You know, it's changed the lives of thousands of people. It's saved a lot of people. It's supported a lot of people. And it's where I put a lot of the frameworks a lot of the practices and a lot of the tools that created my own quantum leaps because I really want other people to have them. All right, so this episode is starting my inquiry into spirituality, and I wanted to begin in a place I wouldn't normally begin. This is what the rest of this episode is going to be, which is getting into some of the things that I believe spirituality is not, is not. I know that seems strange, but once again, I'm doing this because I want to save you time and energy in a way that's one of my jobs. It's what I'm kind of here to do. I make a ton of mistakes. I try a ton of things. And then I report back, you know, I'm the little reporter. And I've seen a lot of folks get sucked down into rabbit holes and waste a ton of time and energy. So I wanted to share some of my thoughts around this. It might subtly shift the way you practice. It might subtly shift your starting place or your beliefs. And I hope that it does. And I hope that more people have more conversations like this because I think it's really important. You know, a lot of people that I know come to spirituality through a kind of broken relationship with religion. And I'm not saying religion is broken. I am saying sometimes the way it's practiced 
in our country, which is often through like an authoritative figure that is the only person that can access spirit or God or the truth or knowledge alongside very outdated, very rigid, very limiting kinds of rules that end up doing a doozy on people's psyches, you know? Again, I'm not saying every temple or church or, you know, gathering is like that. I just get a lot of people in my world, whether it's through the patrons or clients who have been damaged by like fundamentalist, authoritative, patriarchal, hierarchical thinking. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, you can go back many years ago. I did an incredible episode with Aaron Johnson around religious trauma. I think the title is You're Not Going to Hell. So you can go back and listen to that. If you're just tuning in now or you haven't listened to that episode or you want to listen to it again, if that's you. That wasn't me. I I didn't have that. But I will say I had the cultural stuff because it's definitely in our culture, right? It's the water we swim in in a lot of ways. So that being said, the first thing I wanted to point out or discuss is that spirituality is not the wellness or self-development industry. Sometimes spirituality attracts those who have internalized this fixing mentality or a mentality that they are fundamentally broken or wrong, which as we know, is the toxic shame viewpoint. So they enter into these realms thinking, well, if they only do this thing or have this morning routine or go to this plant medicine ceremony these many times or eat this diet or, you know, we could be here all day, they'll be fixed, then they'll be better, then they will finally be okay because they've been a good girl or boy or person. When you are a good person, you'll get rewarded. When you're eating these things and thinking these thoughts and whatever, then, if then, right? And if they do everything right and everything that the program tells them to do, and wonder why they still feel bad or wrong, then they do another thing. Then there's always another diet. Then there's another coach. Then there's another protocol. (laughs) Then there's, you know, there's another this, another that. And they don't stop and think that something else is going on here and and they have to get to the root cause. That has been a tremendous opening, sky clearing, sun coming out in my own life as someone who was really like indoctrinated and raised to like get good grades, get a good job, go to a good school, keep going, keep going, keep going. And in a lot of ways, that was masking a lot of toxic shame that I had, you know? And once I started healing my toxic shame, which of course is an ongoing process, you know, just realizing that there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need to be fixed. I'm not a self-improvement project. I won't be more deserving of love or enjoying my life or whatever after this, that, and the other, and that really it's about my relationship with me and myself. And yes, it's true, self-love, it is true. And yes, loving other people in my life and being connected to other people in my life, yeah. A lot of that drive to always be, you know, doing this thing or that thing, a lot of it went away. For folks who were told from childhood that they were the problem or who took on others' burdens as the fixer, meaning they derived their worth from helping other people. By the way, you can be all of these. I have been both. I have been told I am the problem, you know, been the scapegoat in many scenarios and also have you know, codependently 
been in phases where I realized that I felt like I was only worth things if I could help people. So I've been both. I think they can often work hand in hand. You know, us folks, right, can easily get trapped in the seductive hamster wheel of so-called healing because it offers the illusion of control. And once again, your friendly podcast host reminding you that a very extreme level of control is a trauma response or it is a distraction. It's a way to keep running in place, so to speak. And I also need to say, because we live in nuance here, (laughs) there are things that work. If you have a nightshade allergy and you stop eating nightshades, your life will be changed. It will be significantly made better. If you have the kind of body where you need to eat a ton of protein and you add that protein and you get rid of, I don't know, you know, another food that's draining or gives you a headache, your life is going to be a lot better. If you bring in a morning practice like morning pages, like we did in the artist's way or prayer or meditation or, you know, movement, whatever, it might dramatically change your life. I've done many classes that have dramatically changed my life. You know, like there are many different tools and modalities that have helped me. So I'm not saying there aren't things out there that will help you. I am gently asking you to consider your motivation. If your motivation is I'm doing this because I'm fundamentally wrong and I'm the problem, and if I do all of these things, I can finally prove I'm not, I don't know that that's the best use of your energy and time. Quite frankly, you know, approach it from a place of love, you know, because an imprint of toxic shame is not a strong foundation to build upon. I think we can at least agree on all of that. And to that point, A lot of folks, you know, like a lot of folks in these industries convince us that we're wrong or that something is missing and that if you do this thing, this one thing that they're selling, you'll be healed, everything will be great. And again, I'm not saying that can't happen. For some people, medications are life-changing. For other people, nervous system work is, you know, for others, it's art. For others, it's leaving a job that is, you know, stressful, whatever it is, right? Sometimes it's all true. Sometimes it does work, right? I'm not saying that like everybody in certain industries are malicious. By no means. Most people who are in these industries, including myself, really want to help people, you know? I remember when I first discovered moon mapping in, you know, lunar lunar work, I mean, it changed my life. It absolutely changed my life. And I just wanted everyone to know about it. And I just like went on a whole mission to let everyone know about this process that could change their life too. I fundamentally believed in it and I still do believe in it. I just believe in a lot more now. And I also believe that there are many different things you can do. We have to address things, mind, body, spirit. That's what I believe. And again, if someone is coming to it thinking it's going to solve other problems and they're just going to take this one pill or that they're not going to have to put effort in in other ways in their life, you know, they might be in for a rough ride. Because a lot of these, you know, protocols or whatever, what have you, are presupposing that you fundamentally already love yourself, you respect yourself. And you don't have neurodivergence, you know, that you can like stick to a plan, that you can get up at the same time, that you can like keep doing certain things every day, habit stack, you know, all of that. They're presupposing a lot of things. And people are so different. We all have different places that we're starting from. One thing you need to think about is if you have any subconscious scripts you're running, 
I call them the three S's of colonialism, and they are shame, scarcity, and separation. Any of those cannot be fixed with one pill. It's a deeper process. And to contrast, spirituality is this idea that you're already whole, you're already love, you're already a child of the universe. You came into this reality because the whole world wanted you here. What if when we were children and babies, everyone around us, from our family to our neighbors, to our friends, to our teachers, to you know everyone we came into contact with, what if we were treated with the fundamental belief and idea that we were meant to be here. And in fact, the whole world conspired. The whole world prayed. The whole world put out all the steps for you to be here because you're a miracle. What would change? What would happen if you knew on a cellular level that the whole world wanted you here, that your existence is proof of miracles. Because spirituality just isn't a self-improvement project. It's a totally different perspective than like school, you know? Like we're just taught, like you have to get really good. And I'm not saying we want to refine our viewpoints and our energy and our consciousness. Hello, like I'm constantly doing that. But I'm not doing it from a place of I need to do it or I won't be a good person. It's it's just a larger kind of growth learning process, you know? There's also, you know, this interesting thing when we take this viewpoint that it's not a self-improvement project. And in fact, maybe it's not about these values we've been told to like go faster, harder, amass more, get more power, whatever it is. It's this totally different perspective. And so there's often a period of disillusionment after there is a period of waking up. Usually there's like, we're always like enlightenment is this very long process. It's a lifetimes long process. And I would say that I don't even believe that. I, I mean, I don't even want to become enlightened. That's not a goal of mine. If it's a goal of yours, beautiful. It's just not a personal goal of mine. But there is this thing where you see something. I mean, think about everything you've been seeing over the last decade or so, you know, as part of growing up. You see these things, and then there's usually this period of bliss or this period of oneness, this period of integration. Then there's often a drop where you'll lose motivation once you begin to see through more things because, you know, a spiritual consciousness is one where you're beginning to see through things. You have to find a deeper meaning or a new meaning. You have to create your own meaning, you know? I think it can be a lot easier when you align really naturally with the meaning that has been given to you. For example, let's just say you've been given a blueprint around, you know, monogamous relationship, house, kids, stability, nothing changing. I'm not saying that's easy because it's actually not easy. I'm just saying it's easier to obtain in a society that tells us that this is what we're supposed to be doing. It's this blueprint we've, a lot of us, have been given by society. It's much more challenging. If you're listening to this, you might be in this camp that I'm about to say. It's much more challenging to find your own life's path meaning, like your own personal soul or spirit's life path meanings because we have more than one and even more challenging still to implement it in a world that can make it challenging to nurture a more leading edge or a more visionary or a more unique template and next year i'm going to be doing a lot of resources to support us next year 
in the hermit year, we're going to be seeing this more and more, you know, people going off the blueprint, leaving the blueprint, people going off grid, so to speak, forging their own path, doing their own thing, exploring more of their own things next year. It's going to be a huge signature of next year. You heard it here first. But we can make it more simple. You know, we can make it more simple. We don't want to be harder on ourselves in a world that, you know, makes can make things, can make innovative things challenging, to say the least. Okay, so we got that. I think that was very thorough, and we never have to go back to that theme because I feel very complete around that. Do you? Yes, I definitely do. The next one is that spirituality or being a spiritual person or operating through spiritual tenets does not mean you will get whatever you want. This is really important. You are not a bad practitioner or devotee or a bad witch or mystic if shit is going off the rails and times are tough. This is a normal part of being a human. You are not bad or doing it wrong or, you know, not doing the practice enough or like whatever it is, whatever the other lies are we get told by certain people. Life is just hard sometimes, you know. A lot of manifestation rhetoric out there teaches if you master manifestation, you will get exactly what you want. This is also like not true in my experience. Like this is not how I practice magic. Have I gotten many things that I've wanted? Yes. Have they showed up in the way that I thought they were going to? No. And part, I think, of spirituality is surrendering and trusting that the universe knows better than you do, right? And so to have, like, to be very, like, I need this thing or I need this amount or whatever, mm, I don't think it's the right way to go about doing these things. And we also know, once again, this is a control response. Like, in what world does believing We are supposed to get everything we want, exactly how we want it, help the earth, the community, or even us. Part of growing as a person is dealing with suffering, loss, grief, adversity, challenge. Like that is what makes a person, unfortunately, you know, I mean, I wish like I'm praying every day to the goddess for me to make my life a little bit easier. I don't want to learn by hard things anymore. I'm like, dear goddess, she's learned a lot of great lessons from hard stuff. Can we please make the lessons come much more easy? And you can do that. You can like pray in that way. But it's so unhinged. It's so irresponsible to teach this. And it's also just so illogical and so unreasonable, you know? And I think the idea that a form of spirituality, if you practice it in a certain way, will give you that, I just think, I mean, we do have IQs left, don't we? Like, we can use some critical thinking, right? Like, we can understand how this promise can't be a promise, (laughs) you know? It just can't be. Life is not about getting what you want. That's not the meaning of life. And so, of course, spirituality is not about getting what you want, you know? I could do a whole series breaking this down, beginning with like, again, why on earth do you think you know what's best for you? Mm -hmm. With a dash of, well, there's some colonization programming in that, of course, prosperity gospel all of that. And ending on just a little bit of, it's just delusion. It's delusional. It's delusional. It's delusional. It's just not healthy either. It does not make for healthy humans, you know? It makes for narcissistic humans, I think, you know? Because that's a sign of narcissism is extreme control, you know? I think that this idea has seeped into other areas other, you know, portions of spiritual worlds where, because sometimes it attracts people who feel like they have no power. And a lot of folks are drawn to say astrology or witchcraft because it offers them power, power in the form of knowledge, power in the form of control and power in the form of agency. I will say what spirituality offers us 
is that it offers us inherently more agency. It offers us the gifts of surrender and trust, as well as self-empowerment, should we choose to adopt those and utilize those. So that was my next point, that it's not about getting everything you want. And if you operate in that way, you're going to be in for some disappointment, to say the least. The next is spirituality does not heal trauma. Can it heal trauma? Sure. Again, like I'm, I'm open. But if you have trauma and you need trauma healing, you might need to go to therapy. You might need trauma therapy instead of spirituality, or you might need trauma therapy in addition to a spiritual practice, you know, things like EMDR, somatic experiencing, brain spotting, hypnosis, and so on. Again, spiritual frameworks can certainly help, but there is, again, a problem if you're coming to it thinking it will be the magic pill. There are some forms of spiritual practice, like psychedelics, can create more trauma, can re-traumatize someone. You know, again, it's very rare, but it can happen. So spirituality can help, but you might also need therapy as well. What I will say is if you're coming to spirituality, again, not to be like fixed, It does solve the problem, I think, of separation. You know, separation is such a definitive both cause of trauma. I think some people like Gabor Monte would say it's like a key component of trauma because the opposite of trauma he espouses is connection, right? Separation can also be a root of trauma, feeling like you don't belong fundamentally, you know, feeling like you're not wanted anywhere, like that is a trauma. And as I said a little while ago, spirituality is an inherent belonging. And as you interface directly with God, the universe, your higher self, your your spirit, your heart, you know, whatever you want to call it, there is healing for sure because there's healing in connection and there's healing in the support that that direct interface gives you. You're like, wait a minute, there's someone out here looking out for me? There are many, many angels who want to help me and support me. I've had many circumstances of healing within certain spiritual modalities, you know, like I'm thinking of a past life regression I had once that literally changed my life. It was so incredibly healing. So I'm not saying that's not possible, but don't confuse it because there are certain traditions that don't address trauma at all. And some people, a fundamental aspect of their healing is having their trauma acknowledged and supported. I'm thinking of this spiritual teacher, Adya Shanti, I believe is his name. And in one of his works, he says over and over and over, this is not trauma healing. This is not trauma healing. Like so many times. And I was so grateful for it, you know? I was so, so grateful for it because I think more spiritual practitioners or philosophies, I think explicitly need to say that. It's something else. It really is something else. Even in like certain Western traditions, I'm thinking of young in the West, like didn't necessarily explicitly address trauma. A teacher of mine said he just called it neuroses, which is much different than having PTS or, you know, CPTS or something like that. Again, spirituality is healing, but if there is something you need in order to get specialized help, get the specialized help that you need. If you need meds, get meds and so on and so forth. I'm sharing this because I love you and I don't want you to waste your time Goldilocksing things. I am a Goldilockser. <laughs> Are you one? You're like, well, this isn't quite right. This isn't quite right. So I want you to save your time and energy. And so again, if you go looking for something and this thing isn't going to help you with that thing, you might spend a lot of time 
spinning your wheels, feeling worse about yourself, and not getting the support that you so deserve, gentle listener. Last but not least, spirituality is not a modality. It is not a modality. It is not astrology. Is astrology spiritual? Sure. Can it be used in ways that are decidedly not spiritual? Uh Uh-huh. That goes for any modality, breathwork, tarot, so on and so forth. You know, there are certain modalities, in my humble opinion, that were even created under the guise of being spiritual, but might simply have been solely a money-making operation. So it's not a modality. Do not conflate it as such. Modalities are tools, but they are not the thing. There's that saying, don't confuse the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. Some tools will work phenomenally for you and will change your life. Some will not. You need to try a tool for at least 30 days consistently to see if it is supporting you. There are thousands of tools. Isn't that amazing? Go have fun. Okay, that all felt really important and really good to share as like the precursor. If this felt important to you, please send it to a friend who might also need to hear it. I really hope that with the free resources I create, such as this podcast, is that it saves people time and energy. I went through hell and back. I've spent thousands of hours and easily over $200,000 healing. I'm certified in hypnosis, breath work, mind-body somatic coaching. I am a psychic medium. I have a master's and I'm working on a second one. I've worked for myself for 12 years. I've made millions of dollars. I've made every mistake you can make in life and in business, probably also spiritually. (laughs) And I became an expert in certain areas because of all the time, energy, I have put into it. If I cannot share what I've learned and what is effective and what can help you as well as what might not be effective and what might not help you, what is the point? That's truly one of the points of this is to help one another. So if I can help save you time, energy, and money, I am overjoyed to be able to do so. Do not forget to use pod when you are checking out to get your many moons for free shipping for the next week or so. All of that will be in the show notes as well. I am wishing you so much goodness, so much love, and hoping that whatever it is you most need comes your way soon. Bye for now. Moonbeaming is a Moon Studio production. It is edited by the wonderful Amelia Ruby at Softer Sounds, and theme music is by Melissa Caitlin Carter of Making Audio Magic. Hire them both for all your audio and podcast needs. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're always looking for aligned sponsors. So if you are a business or creative who'd like to sponsor an episode or two, reach out. If you love this podcast, please consider joining our membership to support it. Sharing on social media, passing it along to friends, or leaving us a five-star review. We'd appreciate it so much, and we appreciate you. Thanks for being here.